sorry, that was really awkward. You could have just said ditto or something like that. Um, so before I really jump in here, we're going to show you a little tool for your classes as an extra um, add-on. So if you want to use your phone and scan this QR code now and get into Mentimeter, just to let you know, this is a way to get students actively engaged in class that is um, free to them. Bring your own device. Um, we are using this now in our sections of 330 students. Um, we are paying an annual fee as a faculty member to use it that's very low. And so we used to have students buying clickers for $60 each, and this has been a, and a great tool. So we're just going to do a couple things in Mentimeter to get you um, participating, but I thought it was worth um, giving them. Actually, I have no stake in Mentimeter. <laughs> it's just a tool we use. Um, we thought we'd show you a little bit about that. So um, as you're getting into the Mentimeter, and we'll come back to it in a minute, I just want to introduce ourselves and kind of just tell you, I see a lot of familiar faces, which is so nice, but I also see a lot of people that I may have never met before. So just a little bit of our backstory, because I think it's um, we're pretty unique um, in this world. So Danae and I, so I am Danae, sorry, I am Bro I just said I'm Danae. This is bad, <laughs> bad start. I don't know who I am, oh no. Uh, I am Brooke. The one from Arkansas, if you can tell um, by the accent. <laughs> Yay, Karen! Uh, Danae actually is from Canada, and we crossed paths in Louisiana, um, I won't tell you what year, a long time ago, in graduate school. So she came into graduate school a year behind me. Um, we became best friends. We celebrate our best friend anniversary every year on Super Bowl Sunday. Um, that's when we hung out. We're planning a cruise for our 25th anniversary. Um, so graduate school, best friends, went off, did our internships, we're both clinical psychologists. Um, I got a job at Missouri State University in Springfield, which is kind of, you know, kind of close to home, Arkansas, for me. Um, there was a job the next year in clinical psychology, and she was finishing her internship, and I was like, you got to apply for this job because you could get a free trip to come see me if you got an interview. You know you're poor. You're like, free flight, yes. So she literally does it. She applies for the job and gets an interview, and we're like, yay, you can come see me in, in Missouri. And then she actually took the job. So we have been working together as best friends now for over 20 years with offices next door to each other. We teach the same classes, we do research together, we wrote these books together. So I don't think anyone's as lucky as us on, on the planet in terms of their um, academic career. So that's kind of the background story and why those bios sounded eerily weirdly similar because we are kind of one brain we say. So if everyone's in um, to Mentimeter, I'm gonna go back and try to explain also we thought we were being really clever with the title of our talk, this whole Groundhog Day thing, and then we realized when I was looking for like anything, any reference to the movie Groundhog Day is what we're actually referencing, not when, when the groundhog actually looks for its shadow. And then we realized how old that movie is. So for those of you in the crowd who have no idea what we're talking about, now I feel like I'm trying to teach my intro students about something that I found hilarious 30 years ago. But. Um, the idea behind this is the idea of the movie Groundhog Day where he gets up and every day ends up being a repeat of the same day. So that's what we're going for. And that's what, uh, oops, let me see if my slide's gonna. I don't know if I need to be somewhere else to make this advance. Oh, oh there we go. I'm just gonna walk back here then. Um, so how many of you guys, let me just get a, like how many in the, in the room teach undergraduate psychology classes. Okay, most of you, how many of you will probably be teaching in the future? Or you, you see that in your future? Okay, so if you have not taught before, my guess is that you're going to have this experience at some, at some point in your future where basically you teach the same classes year after year, semester after semester, and what ends up happening is regardless of how you try to tackle the content or how you decide to divvy up your class, um, you end up seeing the same kinds of issues pop up for your students semester after semester after semester to the point where it becomes really kind of predictable that you know what's going to go wrong. So one of the things that um, Danae and I were really involved with at Missouri State was an, a complete redesign of introductory psychology. So that's been kind of our baby for a long time. And we redesigned the class to try to get students to read, do something, interact with the text, take quizzes and stuff like that before they come to class. And then we would have them have that assignment due the day before class so we could go in and mine the data to find out, well, what do they actually need from me then? 
They're already doing the reading, they're doing the quizzing. What do they need me to do in the class to help them with stuff they're not understanding? So we envisioned that we would be spending this like 24 hour period frantically redoing our lectures, right? Each semester. So we did do that for a year, like we did. We used all the data, we redid the lectures, and then the next year I'm looking at the data and I'm like, Groundhog Day, it looks exactly the same as last year's data and they're having the same problems over and over and over again. So just a quick little uh, test to see whether or not you guys would come up with the, the idea of what problems you think students are gonna struggle with. We're gonna go over to Mentimeter and try to do a little word cloud. So what I want you to type in, hopefully this deploys out to your phone, what topics, we're gonna go with the learning chapter. So like intro or even a learning class, things like that. What topics do you think students struggle with the most in that chapter? So if you took intro psych, maybe a million years ago, you teach intro psych, um, what, what, is, what is it about that chapter that you would predict students are gonna struggle with the most? I love the answer, reading. <laughs> that might be an all-encompassing problem. Not necessarily a specific problem. Okay, I think we're starting to see a word cloud theme here. So, <laughs> operant conditioning, classical conditioning, negative reinforcement. Every single semester, everyone who's taught this agree? This is hard, right? It makes sense why students struggle with this when we, we are teaching it. I think sometimes as faculty members, we actually um, get a little bit blind to what it's like to try to learn this for the first time. It's so easy for us now to understand this stuff because we've been thinking about it, we've been learning about it and teaching about it for years and years and years, but that first experience with this concept um, I'll just tell everyone, I got a C on my first intro psych exam, and that was the worst grade I had I'd gotten in college to that point. And I was like, oh, 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 this is hard. So I'm thinking I didn't get it either the first time around, but I think I got it now. So what, what, what's the process uh, of getting there? So one of the things that we're gonna talk about today is taking this um, approach to teaching a class where, point it here, point it here. <laughs> All right where you actually take a premeditated approach that you're gonna address the things that students struggle with the most using your valuable class time. We all have a finite amount of time with our students, whether or not it's online, whether or not it's seated, whatever it is, we only have so much time and probably one of the biggest decisions we have is how do you spend that time? What do you do with it? How much content do you cover? Do you, what kind of skills do you try to teach? I don't know if Eric's in the room. That's for, he, that's for you, Eric. Um, those are the kinds of things that you have to decide. And one of the things that we decided is I want to make sure there was a lot of buzz when we first redesigned this class that we're basically taking the teacher out. We don't need a teacher anymore. And I'm like, oh no, I do not think that is true. But they actually need us in very specific ways. So when you teach, about the learning chapter, they probably don't actually need you very much when it comes to Bandura. It's fun to talk about, right? Really cool videos, you might wanna cover it, but they don't need you to, to tell them that you can learn by watching other people, right? They can get that in other ways. But what they do need you for are some of these difficult concepts related to negative reinforcement, positive reinforcement, classical conditioning. That stuff is very hard, and I think that that's our job then to focus in on those. So how do you do that? How do you identify them, first of all, and how do you target them? So I'm gonna talk about how do you do that ahead of time? Like how do you go about challenging and dealing with these difficult concepts when you're planning your class time? Danae's then gonna talk to you about what do you do when it happens in a class, like impromptu kind of situation. So this is gonna be the premeditated part. And one of the things is talking about, first of all, how do you identify difficult concepts? Well, first of all, there's actually an empirical literature out here. Um, it's small, but there is some data out here that could give you some hints as to what the problems are gonna be. Maybe you haven't taught this, 
topic very often or you just want to dig into that literature. So this is actually a study by Grung and Landrum that was published in 2013. Now they were talking about bottleneck concepts. We're calling them difficult concepts today. Um, similar kinds of uh, ideas about concepts. But if you look, this is actually the entire course of intro and they, they surveyed over 60 faculty members and had them rate how, how much of a bottleneck concept is this for students. So what's the very first one in all of intro? Operant conditioning, punishment versus reinforcement. What's the second one? classical conditioning, unconditioned stimulus and responses, and then if you look just a little bit further down, you're gonna to get to schedules of reinforcement. So faculty across the board are saying, yeah, my students have a really hard time with this. So one of the things that Danae and I did, um, and this is around the same time, maybe 2013, 2014, is we surveyed an additional 40 faculty members, and we took all the major concepts in each chapter and had them rank them the top three most difficult concepts in each chapter. I think learning is always an easy example because we're all like, yes, we know this is a problem. It's a little bit harder in some other chapters when we talk about like development, like what is the hardest thing for them in the, in the development chapter? But in learning, our data mimicked this exactly. So top three most difficult concepts in the learning chapter were operant conditioning, I'm sorry, uh, basically negative reinforcement versus punishment. Um, we're also classical conditioning, terminology, and schedules of reinforcement. Those were the top three in our data as well. So another way to try to get at data, and this is something that we do regularly, is using data from your own students semester by semester. I really like that we still do this even though we may get the same results. Students really seem to respond well when I say, I checked your, your quiz data last night, and this is what you did. Like this is what I see as you having a problem. It makes them feel um, like you are you're actually paying attention to where they're struggling and that you are responding. Like this is the reason we're doing this in class is because you really need this help. So that's why I think it's very important to consider these areas of data and not just go on your 20 years of teaching experience. So one of them is through homework, like how did, what, what kinds of things did you get depending on, now I teach, a, we teach classes of 330 people, so I'm not having people like write me a summary <laughs> of anything. So I do, we do have them do online quizzing Prior to coming to class, after they read a chapter, they have to do an online quiz. I think you and I and everyone in this room knows they don't always read the chapter and do the quiz. There's a lot of like do the quiz part. And we are, we have, we've accepted this <laughs> because before we required them to do this and we said things like, but when I see you next week, make sure you read chapter three. And then I just showed up without an assignment. They were zero chance they were gonna do anything. No quizzing, no reading, no nothing. So at least we're getting them exposed. And we, we assign this for a grade. So I think that's kind of a critical part too, is that we have students do their quizzing before they come to class for a grade. And it is a very small grade um, in our class. It's a low stakes quiz. Um, but as I always say, my students aren't very good at math. So if you put points on anything, they will do it. So we have a thousand points in our class and I can offer like one point of extra credit and they're like, done. I'm doing it right now. So you can actually make things very low stakes and get students to do them. So I'm gonna show you how we look at, this is an example of kind of our online quizzing program that we're using and everyone's got their own variety of this, but this is how we would dig down into the data to look at these difficult concepts, all with the idea of what am I going to do with my valuable class time? That's the goal. What am I gonna do with this time in class? This is actually an overall screenshot of how did my students do on this assignment, first of all. Um, the red bar on the left is actually my students' name, so I'm not showing you those. It tells you whether or not a student in particular is trending up or down or things like that. But I wanna go into actual quiz data. So here is learning. I said we would um, talk about learning. So the nice thing here, these are all the questions they answered, and this is their real data. And so the dark green bar in this case says they got it right the first time. The light green bar says they got it right the second time, and this is the whole class. And then the orange bar, they got it right on the third time. Red or blank means they never got this question right. They had three tries, it never happened for them. So all I have to do, because it's easy, is just scan, and I'm looking for short, dark green bars, right? That means the majority of the class did not get this answer correctly on the first try. That's where I'm gonna dig in a little bit. So I see like the first question does not look like they did particularly well on it. Remember, this is after they've had some exposure to the material. Like they've actually read whatever the textbook had to offer them. 
And then they took this question and they did not understand it. So the first and third questions, to me, when I look at this screen, I'm like, okay, what's going on with those questions? It's important to look at the question because sometimes it's just a bad question, right? You read it and you're like, well, yeah, I, don't, I get that. I know why they said that. But there is so much opportunity there for you to figure out, oh, this is the problem. So let me give you an example. I don't know if you can read this. <laughs> Are you clicking at the same time yeah. I am? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so I'm going to read this out loud because it's really hard for you guys to see. Bill hates to clean up after dinner. One night he volunteers to bathe the dog before cleaning up. When he finishes with the dog and returns to the kitchen, his wife has cleaned everything up for him. Which of the following statements is most likely to be true? Okay, the green check mark tells us this is what percent of people actually answered this correctly. Bill's wife has negatively reinforced him for bathing the dog. We're like, okay, only 41% of people got that right. To me, the critical thing is 59% of the class said Bill's wife has positively reinforced him for bathing the dog. Okay, that's not a bad question. That's a misunderstanding <laughs> of what, what positive and negative reinforcement are. So I've got that. All right, I've got a little note in my head. They're having trouble with this. <laughs> now this next question this is the third question, and it says, when a stimulus is removed from a person or animal resulting in a decrease in the probability of a response, it is known as and 58% of them said negative punishment, and 30% of them said negative reinforcement. Okay, so we've got some hypotheses here. So I'm gonna hypothesize, if you want to click. They don't understand two things related to negative reinforcement. Based on that data, negative reinforcement occurs when an aversive stimulus is removed. That's, that's getting lost in translation here. They are having trouble with that. And negative reinforcement leads to an increase in behavior. Based on their data on those two things, a lot of people in my class are struggling with those concepts. So I already know that, like this is before class. So what can I go do in class that would help them with this, um, these two problems? So one of the things I'm gonna do is a little bit of hypothesis testing. So like Mentimeter, we use feedback in the class. So I'm gonna put a question up right at the beginning to test my hypothesis basically. The difference between negative reinforcement and a punishment is that there's two reasons for this. I wanna make sure I'm right before I spend all this time doing stuff. The other thing is I really want to hit some metacognitive awareness here. Because have y'all had this experience where you ask your students, you're like, so do you guys understand the difference between negative reinforcement and punishment? And what do they do? They either don't make eye contact or it's like, uh, yeah, I'm sure, whatever. Will, will you shut up if I say yes? Like kind of, right? And so, I need my students, it's, it's not just important for me to know what they don't understand, it's actually critically important for them to know what they don't understand. So doing something like this sets the stage for everything, right? So I've got this quiz question up here, I've already hypothesized based on their data that this is true, and then I put this thing up there and I'm like, oh, oh, it looks like half of us are not getting this. Let's do something about that. So I've already planned it. I already expect it. I'm ready to go with the things in my backpack, basically, um, of what we're gonna do. So some of the things we do, we do a whole host of things. Um, but we try to do a lot of active demonstrations, um, activities in class where everyone gets involved. We will show videos. We have really targeted videos towards these misconceptions that last two to three minutes of each, little whiteboard videos that we wrote. We will use those to target these. Um, an example in this class of uh, what I do, or I've done, um, I don't know if many of you guys know John Skalski, he's at BYU-Idaho now, and he did this demo, this was years ago, at NITOP, and I was like, yes, that is going to help my students. So this is basically a demo to demonstrate the difference between negative reinforcement and punishment. The class decides to get someone to do a behavior in the class that the person doesn't know what they're gonna do. So they come back in, you put a backpack on them, and anytime they do anything that's um, getting them further away. So this class decided they wanted this um, woman to go stand in the corner and turn in circles. So as John is leading the demonstration, she's got the backpack on, she's standing there, and he's like, you're not doing anything, so I'm gonna put a book in, I'm putting a book in your bag, and that is punishing. So we've added weight to your bag, that is punishing. She's like wandering around, she gets, like she takes one step towards the corner, he goes, oh, you're doing something that is approximating what I want you to do, here's a book out. He's putting books in and out and in and out and talking through, this is negative reinforcement. 
I've just taken away something really heavy because you did something that I want you to keep doing. So he's talking through it with the backpack. The, the, the students are obviously engaged in this, and it's a really effective demonstration of the difference between these. This takes less than five minutes to do this in a class, um, and well worth that time so that students are going to remember that. Like I said, we also have little brief videos. I'm going to show you an example of that in just a minute. But we have some data about does this actually work. So here's a question that we'll throw up on the screen after we do this demo. Decreasing of behavior involves the use of blank, whereas increasing behavior involves the use of blank. We try not to do the same question, but a similar parallel question. And now, this is actually my class data. I have 80, whatever that says, 88 or 83 percent um, of the students actually getting it correct. So always following it up, because sometimes I'm wrong. I'm like, well, we just nailed it with that cool backpack demo, and now I'm, I'm great. You all know this. And then I put that question up there, and it goes down. It'll be like 30%. I'm like, oh, OK. And Danae's going to talk to you about when that happens, you got you to gotta pull something else out of your bag, right? Like, you got to have something else. And so always checking back in to make sure that the students understood. Um, I'm going to show you a little bit of data now. Um, can this actually help? Like, does this increase learning is really the ultimate objective. Like, is this helping? So this is a less than three minute video we showed. Um, on exam day the following week, this is the question that we put on the exam to target that question exactly. Um, and we have a control class who did not receive the intervention versus a class that did receive the intervention. Now, one of the most impressive things to me is that the, the control class got 80% correct on this question. I'm like, oh, wow. But there was also 90% correct and a statistically significant difference between the people who actually had that targeted intervention and people, people who did not on their exam, on a question tied directly to that concept. So we think it's pretty effective, and then we have some more data um, to follow up on that. You want to click over? I think we're going to show a video next. So this is an example of one of those um, targeted videos. And this one comes from the development chapter. Development chapter is a little bit harder. I don't know. Does anyone have any? I don't know if you could make something out of that word salad. Anyone got any ideas? And I'm going to talk like. We always cover some Piaget in our class. We don't cover it heavily, but we cover some Piaget. Does anyone have any ideas about what you think students have a hard time understanding when it comes to Piaget? I'm not a developmental psychologist. Someone in here might have a better idea. Any? Differences between the stages. Differences between the stages, like naming them, what you can do in those stages. Yep, I like that one. Anyone got anything else? Yeah, in the very back. Don't you always love it when someone in the audience says the thing you wanted them to say, and I don't even know you, so thank you for that. Uh, assimilation versus accommodation um, is actually quite difficult, and let me just tell you that I made this video about assimilation accommodation, made a lot of questions to specifically get it, and I would constantly have to be reminding myself as to which one was which. So it, is, it actually is a very difficult um, concept. Here's a video that um, is an example of one of these videos that we created. Um, and this is really actually about my kid. So that's what it's about. Between, Oops. Whoops. Distinguishing between assimilation and accommodation can be a little tricky. According to Piaget's theory, we all have schemas or frameworks that help us organize information. In childhood, these schemas develop through a process of assimilation and accommodation. In the process of assimilation, we take new information and assimilate, or add, it to our existing knowledge. Imagine a schema, or a Santa Claus, that includes an overweight man with a long white beard. When a child encounters Santa at the mall and notices that he is wearing glasses, he assimilates or adds that information into his existing schema so that the schema for Santa now includes an overweight man with a long gray beard wearing glasses. Imagine a filing cabinet with different folders. Each folder contains a schema, and when you assimilate new information, you simply file it away in the already existing folder. Accommodation, on the other hand, occurs when you have to adjust your schema to incorporate new information. One day, when the author's three-year-old walked in McDonald's and saw a large man with a white beard and glasses eating at a booth, she yelled, there's Santa Claus. 
She was quickly told that it wasn't Santa because he did not have on a red suit, he didn't have any elf helpers, and he wasn't at all jolly at being identified as Santa. She then accommodated her schema with this new information and filed it away in a new folder, possibly titled, Not Santa. <laughs> okay, so that video, pre-post question, actually is extremely helpful for our students to be like, oh, okay, so it's the folder with the Santa, the not Santa, that kind of thing. So that's the example um, of a quick video that you could show that might help distinguish these things. Um, I think the last one is I'm going to talk about data. This was a full semester. This was done by some colleagues in Nebraska. So Amanda Williamson and Jonah Garbin in Nebraska actually evaluated the effectiveness of this strategy over the course of an entire semester on a final exam. So people, students who were exposed to these short videos um, while they were learning the material versus people who did not have exposure to any of those videos on questions about the difficult concepts on their final exam, there was a significant improvement in the students who saw these versus students who did not, while the questions that did not target those difficult concepts were the same between classes. So this was just published, I think, in 2022 in Teaching of Psychology um, that was actually really helpful to know we know we can make changes short term, like in the classroom, they get it now, but do they get it later is really kind of the long term strategy. And this was really exciting um, to see that it was helpful in the long run. So I think we're gonna switch around. I'm gonna go up to manage the wheel and Danae's gonna come down and talk about impromptu strategies. I'll try to use this. If it doesn't work every time, I just point back, just change it. Got it. Oh, the technical fun and difficulties. I, I wanted to say too, we actually do know how to use PowerPoint properly in projector, projector mode, but in order to use Mentimeter and have everything work that we wanted to work, we had to kind of you know, make it work like this. So, um, so yeah, we're gonna talk a little bit about kind of doing things on the fly and how to assess where your students are at when they're in the classroom, and then what are some of the things that you can do to help with these difficult concepts. It's really nice when you have the time and you have all the data and you have this time to kind of sit back and look at that and plan your class, but the reality is it doesn't always happen like that. And sometimes it's really nice when things happen organically in a classroom. So sometimes it might just be a question that a student has that's easily answered and you kind of move on. Other times, and I don't know if you've had this experience, but it may be like one question begets another question and another question, and pretty soon you've got this kind of snowball of things going on. And, I, and for me in those moments, that's where I kind of go, uh-oh, <laughs> right? Like, what's happening here? Like, I think there's some major misunderstandings going on about this concept, which is actually a great opportunity then to say, let's step back. What do we need to do? Like really, this is what class is for, right? So we are going to um, look at some of these issues and come up with ways that we can really help you, give you the help that you need at the time that you need it the most. So when do these misconceptions or difficult concepts become apparent? It's either during the class, uh, it could be at the end of class, sometimes the students who will come up to you and talk to you after class. It could be when class is over. And I don't know about you, I don't get a lot of content questions <laughs> between class. Um, not so much anymore, but I always encourage it and I love it when it happens because I think it means that they're thinking about the content. Now one of the things we should talk about first is the importance of having some prior content knowledge in order for this to be able to work, for you to be able to identify difficult concepts in the class, the students have to have had some exposure to the content before. And there's a couple of reasons why this is important. First of all, just having exposure to the content sometimes in itself can activate misconceptions. Right, so you read something, it's almost like priming. You read something and you think, oh yeah, that makes me think of this, or I already know that, and it's this, and that's actually incorrect, right? You think it's punishment, but it's actually negative reinforcement. So that is helpful. And the other thing is that having prior content knowledge is just really helpful for learning overall. When you think about it, you really have to have some knowledge prior to learning this concept, it makes it a lot easier. Which is really the reason when we did our redesign that we were very, very committed to assigning homework prior to coming to class. 
So our students do their homework, they do their readings, they do their quizzes, all, all the things, activities that they do before they come to class. So that the goal is that we could then have these higher level conversations in the class. Now just last week, I was at the Southeastern Psychological Association and Steve Chu did a really great talk on what the best college teachers know. And he was actually talking about this issue of prior knowledge. So I asked him if I could use his slide for this. And of course, he's so gracious, he sent it to me. So he was telling us about Brad Owen. Apparently Brad Owen is a professional poker player. And he was watching an interview with Brad, who I guess after some big game in um, Las Vegas. And this is what Brad said. I've got king five suited in the big blind. There's a straddle on. The button then raises it to 40. I call for 30 more. The undergun calls. We're going three ways to the flop. It's jack six, four rainbow. How many of you understood that 100%? No professional poker players in here, I guess. <laughs> How many of you understood that a little bit? Okay, a little bit. How many of you are like, I have absolutely no idea what that means? <laughs> Exactly. So think about that. Think about how, how difficult would it be for you to learn this to 100%, to really fully appreciate everything that he just said. Now, for some of you, I'm like some of you, whereas I understood a little bit of that. I know how to play Texas Hold'em. I know a little bit about how gambling works. And so even with that, just that little bit of elementary knowledge, I'm going to probably be able to pick up on this quicker than those of you who don't know any of this, right? And I think sometimes in our psychology classes, this is what students hear us saying, right? We have a lot of really geeky, nerdy acronyms that we love. We have a lot of vocabulary. We have a lot of very complicated ways of saying things that are actually relatively simple. And, and so sometimes I think it comes across like this. And if you think about it, I mean, if you think about this situation here, no one here put up their hand and said, I have absolutely no idea what that's saying. And your students in your classes aren't going to do that either, right? Especially if they feel like I don't get it at all. If they have one small question, they might be willing to ask. But this like, I don't understand that at all. Because you know, when you've been in this experience, you might think, well, everybody else knows except for me. So I don't want to out myself that way and ask that question in the class. So I think we need to be mindful of this and we need to think about how can we assess and elicit and create an environment that makes it okay and inviting for students to actually express some of these things that they're finding challenging or difficult. So how do we do that? So you have to now put on your detective hat as a professor. Right? And, and the first one doesn't, doesn't require a high degree in detective school, right? The first one, in terms of assessment, is when you look out and you see this. Right? It's the confused face, which is actually quite helpful. So when I see the confused face, I'm like, aha, something's going on. Now we want to be careful not to point that out and be, Clayton, why are you so confused by what I'm saying? <laughs> Right? Instead, we might want to say, I'm noticing some confused faces in the crowd. Right? Let's talk about this some more. Would anybody be willing to share what's difficult about what we're talking about or what's confusing? Right? So we can use the confused face. We certainly appreciate spontaneous student questions. Right? And it's that, it's that kind of idea that if one student has the question, probably other students do too. So that's like, as a student, that's a really good thing to know. The one minute paper is something that people often use at the end of class. It's sort of this, we've done the whole class, now take a minute and write me a paragraph about what was the most difficult thing for you, what was the most difficult concept or the most confusing thing in class. You don't have to just do this at the end though, right? You could do this in the middle of transitioning between different topics. You could say, take a minute and try to write a summary in a couple sentences of what we just talked about and point out what you think is the most difficult concept in there or what's still confusing to you. And what's neat about that idea is that then you can combine it with a think, pair, share, right? So then you could say, okay, now the minute is up, um, turn to your neighbor and exchange what you wrote. 
right? Because I think it's really helpful for other students to hear Garth isn't going to summarize the last 30 minutes the same way that I am. We both could be right, but he's going to have a different way of doing that. And me listening to him say back to me how he summarized that can be really helpful for my learning. So, and then I'm going to do the same. And then maybe he said, well, what's most difficult for me was this concept. And then I'm like, oh, okay, yeah, what was most difficult for me was this. And that can really lead into some good discussions about, oh yeah, I really understood that, right? And that's what we call peer instruction, and we'll get to that in just, in just a minute. So those conversations, students have a way of talking about concepts that makes more sense to other students sometimes than we do, because we use a lot of the lingo and a lot of the more complicated um, ways of thinking about it. And it's hard sometimes, if you've been teaching for a long time, to remember what that was like back when Brooke got the C on her first test, right? So um, I didn't know that, by the way. I don't remember that. <laughs> um, and so then you can incorporate the kind of polling, the kind of quiz questions that Brooke was talking about as well on the fly too. Now that's a little bit more challenging. Um, sometimes I think there's different software out there. Sometimes it's literally, it doesn't have to be high tech, right? It could be like, let me ask you a question. How many think this, right? You can use hands, you can use, one, one time when I didn't have um, any software, I can't remember why, but I, I had students just using their fingers, one, two, three, or four, you know, those kinds of things. So it doesn't have to be high tech but we could actually do some polling. You could also make some predictions in advance, or you could have a bank of questions that are kind of, it's relatively easy for you to go kind of pull one in, you know, switch over like we're doing, you know, alt tab, go over to your questions, pull one up. So this can be particularly helpful, especially when there might be something that you think is going to be a difficult concept, something that you're just introducing that's new. And I thought as a, a real life example, we could talk about something in here. So this I think would be something relevant to people who teach, particularly intro psych, also abnormal psych, um, clinical psychology, those kinds of things. So one of the things that came out in the new DSM, so the DSM-5 TR, which just came out last year, there was one new disorder. Anyone know what it is? <laughs> one new disorder in the DSM. Is it prolonged grief? Who said that? Gold star. <laughs> Good job. Yes, exactly. It's prolonged grief disorder. So imagine you're my class. We're having this discussion about prolonged grief disorder. And I'm saying, you know, this is, I'm explaining, and you're kind of like, oh, yeah, you yeah, know, that makes sense. I mean, some people have a really hard time, you know, with grief, and it's rough. And, and you're sort of going along like that. And I say, and I'm thinking, this is actually fairly complicated. One of the things that I know that is kind of difficult about this is how do you really hone in on what the symptoms are, and how do you distinguish that from normal grief, right? Because grief is grief. So what makes it prolonged grief? And how is that different? So maybe I have this polling question up, which is going to come out to your phone right now. So do your best and answer this question. The one thing as you're answering this, so I'll point out here, as an instructor, you can notice here's where people are actually answering, so I can see how many people are answering. So when I know roughly how many students are in my class, once I get close to that number, I know I'm ready to move on. What I'll say also about these questions is when you are targeting difficult concepts, the questions tend to be long, right? So some of our best practices for writing multiple choice questions would maybe say don't make a really lengthy question that requires a high cognitive load for interpretation, but these are difficult concepts. And so one of the things we're trying to do when we get to a higher level of Bloom's taxonomy is test these higher level thinking. And, and so we need to have more complicated questions. So one of the challenges is trying to make it you know, as succinct as possible. Okay, well let's see how, how you did. Okay, this is very, very similar to what I would see in class, right? There's kind of a mix, right? Kind of a mix of things. 
And so at this point, if I was going to engage in peer instruction, which we can do right now, so you might need to move if you're not sitting near anybody, but just find someone for a, a couple minutes or a couple people and talk to them about what was your answer, why did you choose it, see what other people put and see um, if they have a different explanation and see if you can together kind of come to what you think is the right answer. So go ahead and just take a minute and do that. or am I going to click on it from the PowerPoint? No, it's already pulled up. You just have to alt-tab and okay. then expand it. Okay. Is that next? Yeah. So I don't go back to PowerPoint. I'm going to go to that next. Yeah, I think that's true. Uh, no, it's not. It's not. You'll have, to skip, you'll have to skip past the question that's in PowerPoint and then go and there'll be the picture of the screenshot of the video and that's when you alt-tab it. Okay. Do we, do we really need to do that, though, if, if that's how I'm going to? I could just go to the video. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So thank you for that. Even, in, even though you are not my actual class, I still get the same warm, fuzzy feeling when I hear everybody talking about content, right? <laughs> Don't you love that when that happens in class and you hear like people actually discussing, well, this is why I have this and this is what I thought. And this is great for a question like this. You don't necessarily have to do this when 98% of the students get the right answer, right? But this is different. So I'm curious, after talking with some people, are there any of you that feel like, if I was to re-poll this, would any of you change your answer? Oh, look at you guys. You're like, nope, I'm right. <laughs> Listen, you're not all right. <laughs> That's interesting. Now, in class, usually what happens is a lot of times after some peer instruction, now keep in mind the difference here is that there are students who have a lot of prior content knowledge. And in this case, probably, I'm guessing a lot of you don't have a lot of background knowledge about this. So that is the difference. So usually what happens is you have some of those students pulling other students along, right, in that peer instruction period. And then we see a shift, if I was to re-pull, more typically toward the correct answer. Now, sometimes what happens is they move the other direction. And I'm like, oh, there are some really persuasive wrong people in class, right? But either way, it's great information. Because like Brooke was saying before, you can't really just be like, so do you have it now? Like, you don't really know until you can actually look at the data. So you want to know what the right answer is? C, the red one. <laughs> so five of you are right. <laughs> so what does it say? The answer says intense loneliness, sense of disbelief about the loss, and avoidance of reminders that the person is dead. <laughs> Someone changed their answer. It just went from five to six. Oh, look. <laughs> Cheater. <laughs> okay, so so this is it's a really good example though, right? Because this is a hard question. It is kind of complicated. And so in the 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 new textbook that um, we just published, psychological disorders textbook, we also created a lot of these videos, which we call adaptive pathways, um, within the book. And so we may we knew that this we hypothesized that this was probably going to be a difficult concept for students. So we created this new video. This is one of our newest ones we wanted to show you. And now that you've had this experience, think about from a student perspective. If it's like, okay, I didn't totally understand this, hopefully this will help. It, it's actually not queued up, so I'm gonna click on it. There was no tab open. Oh, okay. Well, so where is it linked in here, Danae? Okay, hold, hold please. Sorry, sorry. If I click on this, nothing. No, okay. here, hold on. Hold this. Oh. All right. 
Here we go. The loss of someone you love can be a profoundly difficult time for many people. Different people experience grief differently, depending on the kind of relationship you have with the person you lost, your personality, and even your culture. So how can you tell the difference between a normal grief process and the condition known as prolonged grief disorder? There are three primary ways to know if the grieving process has become severe enough to warrant a diagnosis of prolonged grief disorder. First, if an adult experiences a severe grief reaction that lasts over a year, or a child or adolescent experiences a severe grief reaction that lasts over six months, it is possible that they are experiencing prolonged grief disorder. It is common for people who are grieving to experience intense feelings of grief around certain holidays, birthdays, or other special days. However, a person with prolonged grief disorder continues to experience severe grief reactions nearly every day for over a year. Second, in order to consider a diagnosis of prolonged grief disorder, the symptoms must interfere with the person's ability to function. After a year's time, an adult who cannot return to work, who isolates themselves, or who struggles with daily tasks like cooking or paying bills because of their preoccupation with thoughts or memories of their lost loved one, may be experiencing prolonged grief disorder. Finally, Prolonged grief disorder is differentiated from normal grief reactions when the presence of severe grief reactions exceed the cultural, social, or religious norms of the individual. <clears throat> to summarize, while it is normal for people to experience long-term feelings of grief on holidays or special occasions, when an adult experiences a severe grief reaction that lasts over a year or a child or adolescent experiences a severe grief reaction that lasts over six months, the grief leads to an inability to function and the grief exceeds cultural, social, or religious norms. It is possible the person has prolonged grief disorder. Okay, so did that help? If someone asked you now, like, well, what's the difference between normal grief and a grief that gets a diagnosis? Do you feel like you'd have something that you could say? Yeah, and so I could, see, I could hear some of you too as they were talking in there and then you were like, oh, that's why A wasn't right. Oh, that's why, that's why B wasn't right, which is great, right? So you're kind of monitoring as you're, as you're watching that. And so that, that is one approach that we would, would use. And then um, that's actually the last example, kind of back pocket video examples there. But we'll also talk about you know, different strategies in the moment that can be either student-led or instructor-led. So we talked about peer instruction, right? How students can sometimes bring a really clear and fresh perspective that can help other students. And, and they offer these useful strategies sometimes. Now sometimes it can be incorrect as well, right? So you, had, you do have to kind of monitor this. Um, and then really we use undergraduate learning assistance in our, because we have such big classes with over 300 students. And ULAs or graduate students can be really helpful with this as well. So one of the things we like to do is have, you know, ULAs join these discussions with students. We have our ULAs, the, one of their main jobs in our classes to lead study sessions. Um, small group study sessions prior to each exam. So again, we're helping them learn how to teach those study sessions, but they're still kind of putting their own spin on it using their language. And then in terms of class discussions that are more instructor-led, I think any time that you can use an opportunity to help students build their co uh, metacognitive muscles is a really, really good thing that you should take advantage of. So in this case, what I can hypothesize that we might see is if someone was reading in a textbook about prolonged grief disorder, it's easy to read that and go, yeah, no, yeah, that makes sense, yeah. Right, have you ever done that? You like read it, read it, and then if someone asks you like a detailed question about it, you're like, ooh, <laughs> right? Like, I don't, I don't really know. And so having these discussions with students, like, well, did you think that this was difficult? Well, no, I didn't really think so. Well, why, why is that, right? And so that, that could get into a conversation about judgments of knowing, right? That students, that people in general tend to over predict how much they actually know about a topic, right? Because it feels kind of familiar. They've seen something like it before. It makes intuitive sense, right? And so we read it in a really kind of surface way that we're not processing that information for learning. 
So helping students to recognize that feeling. So the next time you get that feeling of like, oh yeah, 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 maybe you want to pause at that moment and maybe you want to quiz yourself. Maybe you want to imagine what would a test question about this look like? So we sometimes have our students write multiple choice questions, A, to give them an appreciation of how difficult it is to write good ones, but also the act of doing that, you know you have to know the information to write good distractors and things like that, okay? You want to, in these discussions, connect these concepts um, to other concepts that ideally that they've already learned, they have a prior knowledge about, as a way of both interleaving content, which we know is a, is a best practice for learning, and, and just to kind of weave this connection through, because as they are thinking about other things that they've already learned about, that's a form of retrieval practice, right? So this idea of getting information back out of their head is a really good way to promote learning. So in this case, I might have a discussion with students about grief disorder, like, okay, but what do we know about all psychological disorders? How could we think about that? Well, we know for something to be considered a psychological disorder, it has to cause significant distress or impairment in functioning. Right, that's what has to be there. So we know that that's going to be there. So what might be some of those things that could cause distress? What might that impairment look like? And as you start to have these conversations and you're connecting this to what do you know, what you also know is that we always have to consider the social and cultural norms. The context is important, right? So that's kind of like half the video right there. And so helping students to make those connections and really what you're doing is modeling a way of thinking about content. And the more they can learn to do that in their own reading, the better they're able, going to be able to learn. All right. So this conversation doesn't necessarily need to end in the classroom, right? This conversation about difficult concepts can continue. It can continue outside the classroom. So for example, you could give some kind of end of class assessment. You could collect, you could analyze those results, right? Muddiest point or one minute paper kind of thing. You could review that before the next class. You might want to, sometimes I've given my class like a quick little survey on Qualtrics, like a couple multiple choice questions, almost like polling in between class just to see how they do. Um, and then you can bring those into class. And again, that's a great form of retrieval practice. So one semester I started every abnormal psych class with one or two multiple choice questions from the previous class's content, right? Just kind of activating those schemas, that prior content knowledge. Perhaps, and I know um, Brooke does this in her online classes, looks at the data and then um, creates mini lecture videos that she'll then put in our learning management system. So again, you're getting that kind of targeted instruction. There's nothing to say that you can't do that in a face-to-face -face class or a blended class, right? A quick little video way of explaining something. You might even post additional targeted practice between class, right? Here's a little thing, that, it's gotta be quick, right? For People aren't gonna do it if it's not quick. Um, but some little quick thing that you could do, test your knowledge on this, see what you get, to come to class next time and tell me what your score was, right? If it's, especially if it's fun um, and, they're, and kind of like a challenge or you can sort of gamify it in some way, what you're doing is you're interleaving that content and pairing it with retrieval practice, both great strategies. And so you can use all of that information then to hypothesize and prepare for your next class. And then the whole thing starts all over again, right? So really what we've talked about are sort of this premeditated attack, right? Planning, using some data, planning and preparing before class even happens. What can you do on the fly when questions come up or you get a sense that there is a difficult concept in the class, in the moment, how do you address that? And how can you kind of keep this conversation going between class periods? And I think if you can do all of that and you can use all of those strategies, then really we can keep the groundhog where it needs to be, right? And we have no groundhog day in the classroom. So thank you very much. We have a few minutes for questions. <laughs>